Ever wish you could be a fly on the wall in those closed-door congressional meetings? But instead of political gossip, you get to hear their stock picks. Well, it's not quite as secretive as you might think. Oh, really? Yeah, because since the Stock Act got passed back in 2012, members of Congress, they have to let the public know about their financial moves. Okay, so no more, like, secret insider trading clubs in some smoky back room. Everything's out in the open. You got it. Everything is supposed to be a lot more transparent, and you're not going to believe this, but that actually sparked a whole debate about transparency and even led to some interesting investment strategies. And that is exactly what we're diving into today. Let's go. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more Quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Our listeners sent us some fascinating sources about a strategy claiming to, get this, mirror those congressional stock trades. So how does it even work? Well, let's start by thinking about why those trades, they often raise eyebrows. So picture this. You've got lawmakers, right? And they're shaping policies. They're getting those high-level economic briefings. They've got access to information that can move the market, information that most folks like you and I just don't have yet. So there's this possibility that some of them could use that knowledge to give themselves an advantage in the market. You hit the nail on the head. And there have been times, like, back during the 2008 financial crisis or those Affordable Care Act debates, when some of those trading patterns from Congress, well, they raised some serious concerns. So it's not just a hypothetical concern. There's some real world weight to this, mm. which makes the 2012 Stock Act even more intriguing, right? That push for transparency. Absolutely. But the question is, did it actually solve the problem or did it just kind of, you know, change things up a bit? Which brings us to this copy Congress strategy. If the information is out there, is it fair game? Is it smart? And is it even ethical? Good questions. All of them. Let's find out. Now, from what I'm reading here, this isn't about copying every single trade. This is about a specific algorithm. Yeah, it's called inverse volatility weighting. It's pretty interesting stuff. OK, bef before we get lost in the jargon, can you break it down? Think of it this way. Imagine you're at an amusement park. Some rides are like wild roller coasters, right? And some are like the gentle carousel. I am a carousel person, for sure. Me too. But volatility in stocks, that's like the intensity of those rides. Inverse volatility weighting means basically you're giving more attention to the calmer carousels, those stocks that have steadier prices and less to those volatile roller coasters. So it's more about balancing risk than chasing the big thrills. Exactly. And our source really highlights this risk management part of it mm -hmm. because you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, especially if that basket tends to swing up and down like crazy. Which brings us to the other part of the strategy, right? The 10% position limit. Right. It's like a safety net. Even if everyone in Congress seems to be jumping on one particular stock, this algorithm prevents you from exceeding that 10% limit, forces you to diversify, like eating a balanced diet. You got to have your fruits and veggies. You can't just live on potato chips even if they're on sale. Right. right. So we have this very interesting concept. Insider information potentially meets a risk-managed algorithm fueled by public data, but does it actually work? Well, our source claims that this strategy actually beat the S&P 500 with a sharp ratio of 0.934. Now, just to give you some context, the benchmark for that same time frame was 0.7. Remind me what makes a good sharp ratio good. In the simplest terms, the sharp ratio tells you how much return you're getting for the amount of risk you're taking. And typically, higher is better. So yeah. on the surface, that 0.934, it sounds pretty good. It does sound promising, but there's always a catch, right? <laughs> you're right. There often is. This is where we got to put our thinking caps on, mm -hmm. because that performance we talked about, as impressive as it sounds, comes from backtesting, not real-time trading. Backtesting, right? Walk me through that. What does that mean in this context? Imagine you've got a time machine for the stock market. You can go back in time and see how a strategy would have performed. That's backtesting. You take historical data, plug in the strategy, and see what happens. It's a way to test it without actually risking real money. It's not a guarantee of future success. Got it. Exactly. And our source even says 
This was a micro study. It wasn't like a full blown research paper or anything. So while the findings are definitely interesting, we've got to approach them with a bit of healthy skepticism, you know? So we've been exploring this copy Congress strategy and we've uncovered a lot. Insider info, risk management techniques, and even the ethical implications of using publicly available data. But what I find truly fascinating is that this strategy, with all its complexities, might be scratching the surface of a much bigger trend. What's fascinating here is the sheer volume of data we have access to today. Mm. We're not just talking about congressional trades anymore. We're talking about everything from social media sentiment to economic indicators and even the weather. Right. It's like we're swimming in a vast ocean of information and all these data sets are like little islands scattered around. And it's tempting to try and connect those islands to find patterns that might reveal hidden insights. Absolutely. The source even mentions that some of this data is available commercially. So it's not just academics or researchers who are exploring these data sets. It's also businesses and investors who are looking for ways to gain an edge. And that brings us back to this question of fairness and transparency. If you have access to data that others don't, does that give you an unfair advantage? It's a tough question because on one hand, we live in an age of information and those who can access and interpret it effectively are often rewarded. But on the other hand, if it feels like that access is being used to exploit the market, that's where things get murky. So we're left with this ongoing tension between the desire for innovation and the need for fairness in a complex and ever-changing market. Precisely. And it raises questions about how we regulate and govern this information age. How do we ensure that access to data is equitable? How do we prevent the misuse of information for personal gain? It's a lot to think about, isn't it? And it's a conversation that's only going to become more important as the world becomes increasingly data driven. Absolutely. And it's a conversation we should continue to have. I agree. And I think this deep dive has given us a great starting point for those conversations. We've explored the possibilities and the challenges, and it's clear that there's still a lot of ground to cover. This is just the beginning of the journey. Exactly. And remember, the most valuable insights often come from asking the right questions, not just seeking easy answers. So keep questioning, keep exploring, and most importantly, keep learning. Keep diving deep. You know, it's funny. We started talking about this copy Congress strategy, thinking we'd be peeking into the trades of politicians. Right. But this whole thing is so much bigger, isn't it? This whole world of alternative data. Yeah, and it's everywhere. And how it can impact the markets. It really is mind boggling when you think about how much data is out there. Yeah. Our Quant Connect source talked about social media sentiment. Right. But you've got things like, I don't know, satellite images showing how many people are going into stores. Wow. Weather patterns that can tell you about crop yields. Interesting. Even just online reviews and how those can impact the company's reputation. Mm. It's all data and it all tells you a story. It's true. It's like we're living in this detective novel, but instead of fingerprints and footprints, we've got these digital breadcrumbs. Oh, I like that. And somebody somewhere is trying to use them to figure out what's going to happen next. That's a great way to put it. And, you know, it really highlights something important here. What's that? This isn't just about, like, replicating what members of Congress were doing with their trades. It's about understanding how information works in the market. Okay. How fast it moves, who's got access to it, and how that access or lack of it can give people an advantage or put them at a disadvantage. Which takes us right back to that Sherpa ratio of 0.934, right? Yeah. On its own, impressive. For sure. But if it's based on information that most people don't even know exists, let alone how to understand it. It really makes you wonder, doesn't it? Is someone doing well because they're good or lucky or is there something else going on? Right, right. And if this copy Congress strategy is just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. What else is out there? What other data is waiting to be analyzed that could reveal even bigger patterns in the market? It can feel kind of overwhelming, can it? It really can. It's easy to feel overwhelmed by all of it. Yeah. But, you know, I think this conversation has given us a really good place to start. Okay, good. Just understanding that this kind of data exists is a big first step. So we don't need to become data scientists overnight. Definitely not. It's more about being aware of what's happening, asking the important questions. I like it. Like when you hear a stock tip, don't just ask what to buy. Dig a little deeper. Ask why. And that makes sense. You know, what information led to that recommendation? What's the big picture here? It's like that old saying, knowledge is power. Right. But it seems like these days, it's really about informed knowledge, mm -hmm. you know? That's what really gives you the advantage. I couldn't agree more.
Well, that is a great place for us to wrap up this deep dive. I agree. We've covered a lot of ground. We have everything from congressional trading to this inverse volatility weighting, the ethical side of using data. Mm -hmm. And we even got a glimpse into the future of how we might analyze the market. Yeah, and that's what makes it so exciting, right? Absolutely. The world of finance never stands still. Who knows what we'll discover next? That's the beauty of it all. To everyone listening, thank you so much for coming along on this journey with us. Thanks for listening. Keep asking questions, keep exploring, and most importantly, keep diving deep. 